Um, so this is our October RDLA monthly meeting. I'm Shannon Von Felden. I'm the new RDLA program manager. Um, I joined the Every Life Foundation just a couple of months ago, and I'm really excited to meet all of our advocates and partners and um, begin working with everyone. Um, here are some just reminders about the call. Um, for those joining us on the phone, we're having some issues with muting the lines. So if you're not speaking, uh, please go ahead and mute your phone so we can eliminate background noise, such as that. Um, and then um, also, if you are with the media, we ask that you announce your participation and refrain from quoting anyone, but you are free and we encourage you to um, contact participants after the meeting um, to discuss um, direct quotes with them. So thank you. Um, today we have Joel White with Horizon Government Affairs joining us to uh, discuss the new o o opioid law. Um, Kathleen Laird with Senator Tammy Baldwin and Becky Abbott with the National Foundation for Ectodermal Dysplasia are joining us to talk about the new legislation, the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Patricia Egan with the Lymphedema Advocacy Group will be joining us to give us an update on the Lymphedema Treatment Act. And Rebecca Adams, from CQ will be joining to talk about the midterm elections and any end of year legislation that is expected. And then I will be discussing our Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill um, in 2019. Uh, first we have Joel. Joel, are you on the call? Um, if not, um, Becky and Kathleen, are you able to jump in? Yep, I'm here. Becky, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. I will go ahead and skip ahead to your guys' slides. Um, go, um, which one of you would like to go first? Kathleen, you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I'm Kathleen Laird, and I work for uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin, and the first thing I did want to say is that um, everything that I say is completely off the record. Um, if there are folks on the line that want to talk to the Senator's press team, uh, feel free to send me or them a note, and um, they will get back to you, but everything's off the record. Um, but my, my boss, Senator Baldwin was excited to recently introduce with uh, Senator Ernst the Ensuring Lasting <laughs> Smiles Act. And she introduced this really um, thanks a lot to Becky Abbott and hearing um, Becky and her family's story uh, from Wisconsin. And Becky reached out to our office um, a number of years ago about her son, Aiden, and his struggles with ectodermal dysplasias and his struggle um, with uh, very severe sort of oral-related healthcare needs and surgeries and, you know, what Becky and her family were going through with the fact that they had to pay for all of that um, care out of pocket because their insurance company would not cover any of his services or uh, care or surgeries related to his mouth. Um, however, their insurance would cover other aspects of his care related to his congenital anomaly. So we tried to figure out what we could do to help. And um, after talking to Becky and a number of other advocates at NFED, you know, we started to learn that this was a common practice, that insurance companies, m most of them, provided coverage for uh, care related to someone's congenital anomaly, but insurance companies um, systematically and routinely deny uh, payments and any claims for uh, the oral related care. And again, this is not something that, you know, you're going to get your teeth cleaned or to get a cavity filled, but that's essentially, you know, what we heard insurance companies were, were trying to point to saying, oh, this is nothing but 
cosmetic or, oh, this is nothing, but, you know, this is covered in your dental plan. But, you know, reconstructive surgery for a cleft palate um, or, you know, reconstructing someone's jaw is certainly not cosmetic or merely um, a simple dental procedure. So we took a look at uh, what we could do legislatively because my boss believed that, you know, this loophole uh, should be closed, especially if most insurers are already providing this care and that they were just trying to find a way to, um, you know, to find different loopholes to, to not have to pay for certain things. So we actually uh, based the Insuring Lasting Smiles Act after um, an older bill that has long been bipartisan, which was called the CARES Act, and it was introduced in previous Congresses that essentially did the same thing. It was a little bit broader than this. Um, but uh, we used that as a base, and um, our legislation would basically make sure that all health plans um, and these are all health plans, sort of group health plans, individual health plans, cover the medically necessary services, including reconstructive surgeries for oral-related uh, procedures as a result of someone's congenital anomaly or their birth defect. Um, and so while our bill ensures that all coverage, that all insurers cover all of the related services that is related to someone's congenital anomaly or their birth defect. We also carefully stipulate that, you know, all medically necessary services do include um, these, this oral uh, related care and, and any of the adjunctive sort of dental, orthodontic and um, support necessary um, for care of someone's congenital anomaly. And we were so lucky to work with Becky and um, NFED and then um, a number of other groups like the Every Life Foundation and, and RDLA and a number of other um, provider groups who similarly believe that at the very basic level, this should be covered. So I'll stop there and turn it over to you, Becky. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, first of all, I just want to thank quickly RDLA for the invitation to participate, and then also um, Kathleen for taking the time to speak today. And um, on the first slide here, I just have my email information as well as Mary Fate. She's the executive director of the NFED, and her email address if you would like to contact either her or myself. Um, on the next slide, there's a little bit of background information on the need for ELSA. Um, and it just talks about the statistics of children or babies born in the United States with congenital anomalies, and that's uh, about one in 33 babies in the United States. And approximately 40,000 of those will require reconstructive surgery. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, craniofacial abnormalities or anomalies. Uh, these can restrict a child's ability to breathe, eat, and speak in a normal manner. Um, a lot of children who are born with ectodermal dysplasias are missing either many of their teeth, they're only born with two teeth, um, and there's also many children who don't have any teeth at all, which makes it um, extremely difficult for them to eat and chew and speak. Children usually have to um, have uh, speech therapy for many years. I know my son had to have over three years of speech therapy um, just to for his classmates and our, our family to be able to understand him. And all of these um, things can be corrected, but it does take many years. Um, for instance, my son just recently outgrew his lower prosthetic and he's going out with, um, without many of his lower teeth. And now he's having some problems speaking again and chewing and swallowing. So this is a lifelong problem that families um, have to deal with who are either missing teeth or have other dental or oral abnormalities. Uh, surgery can correct and repair some of these anomalies and these are highly individualized and very complex and they're needed to help a child obtain the ability to function and grow normally. And then there's some examples of different deformities um, like Kathleen had mentioned, cleft, uh, cleft lip and palate, and then also there's different um, mouth malformations of like ear, hand, and foot. So um, insurance companies are labeling these services as cosmetic or non-functional in nature. However, the doctors are deeming them medically necessary and insurance companies are still denying these services. 
on the next page, um, it's just talking a little bit about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, which we call it ELSA. And um, like Kathleen had said, this legislation would ensure that all group and individual health plans would cover medically necessary services, including um, those needed for dental procedures as a result of congenital anomalies or birth defects. Um, and those also stipulate that such coverage include services and procedures that functionally repair or restore any missing or abnormal body part that is medically necessary to achieve normal bodily function or appearance. And what is important about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act is that it clarifies that this includes dental, orthodontic, and prosthodontic support. And um, children who are born with exodermal dysplasias often need a multidisciplinary approach to their care since um, their cases are so complex. And this legislation also excludes cosmetic procedures and surgery. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, um, we talked a little bit about uh, Senator Baldwin and why she worked on this legislation and introduced it. And um, this legislation was introduced in late August in the House and Senate. Uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin and Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa introduced it. And the Senate bill is S3369. If you want to look that information up, it currently has four co-sponsors. And then in the House, it was introduced by Representatives Colin Peterson uh, from Minnesota and David Young from Iowa. That bill is House Bill 6689. And as of today, it currently has 13 co-sponsors. As Kathleen mentioned, both um, were introduced and have bipartisan support. And this legislation is to address coverage denials to ensure that children suffering from birth defects and anomalies get the treatments they need. Um, and once again, I just want to mention that this is for all congenital anomalies, not just teeth. Um, teeth are specified and dental and oral procedures, but it's for any a repair of any birth defect. And then um, on the last page, we have a two-step call to action. And the first step is we're asking patient advocacy organizations to sign on to a letter of support for the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. There's a link listed here, um, and I do believe that our DLA is going to be putting up an action alert on their uh, page that you can find it there. So we're asking other organizations to join us and to sign on to this letter of support. There is a list of organizations um, at the bottom of the slide who are currently supporting the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Um, and then the second call to action would be to, um, we're asking patient organizations to join us and advocate for the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act um, to send uh, letters to their legislators to ask them to co-sponsor this legislation um, to ensure that this legislation is successful and that individuals who are born with congenital anomalies and birth defects get the medically necessary treatments that they need. Um, and we can't do it without other organizations supporting us and um, calling and emailing their legislators. And uh, there's a second link where you can register to advocate. And then also the, um, through that link, there is a um, site where you can enter your information. And then also um, there's a letter that you can send to your legislators through that link. So um, that's all I have at this time. And I just want to thank everybody for participating in the call today and um, letting us speak about this um, <coughs> important <coughs> legislation that affects so many families and children. Great. Thank you so much, Becky and Kathleen. Um, we'll go ahead and um, keep moving along. And Patricia, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me, though? I can't tell if I'm yeah. muted or if you can hear nope. me. Nope, you're on, you're good, go ahead. All right, so thank you, Shannon, so much. Uh, the RDLA has been a tremendous help to the Lymphedema Treatment Act, and I can tell you that um, one of the most worthwhile um, activities that I did was to go to the rare disease um, lobby days at the end of February on Rare Disease Day a couple years ago. I learned so much, so thank you. So we, the Lymphedema Treatment Act 
um, we can go to the next slide. Um, it provides the Medicare benefit to cover compression garments and materials needed for the treatment of lymphedema. Um, there's no cure, and right now compression is really the, the thing that keeps this disease from, going, uh, from getting worse. And the reason why we need to do this is because it, compression garments and supplies last about six months, and then they need to be replaced. And the durable medical equipment statute says that things need to last three years. So somewhat like the previous bill, we're trying to close a loophole in the statute uh, so that we can, um, so that patients can get what they need. Um, next slide, please. So we've been at this since the 113th Congress. We're now up to 443 co-sponsors, 379 in the House and 64 in the Senate. The Lymphedema Treatment Act is now the number one sponsored health care bill before Congress. Um, what I am sometimes asked is, well, with those kinds of numbers, why hasn't it gotten to a vote? Well, the reason it hasn't gotten to a vote is because it's stuck in committees. Um, and sometimes the discussion is the bill is only three pages, double-spaced. It's a very small bill. And I've heard people ask, well, why is this coming before Congress? Can't this be taken care of administratively? And the answer that we've been told is, well, if you want to change the statute, you have to take it to the Hill. Next slide, please. So we, the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus has been just tremendous in its support for the, the um, Lymphedema Treatment Act. 92% of the House RDCC members co-sponsors and 86% of the Senate. We so appreciate your including this bill on the legislative scorecard. When I go out to offices, I print out that scorecard and the, P, the different members of Congress, their, their staff, what their scoring is. And some, uh, some of them are really surprised. I mean, they, they have very good scores and they didn't even know it. So I just want to say that RDLA d does a lot of service, so thank you. Next slide, please. So we're trying desperately to get this bill passed before the end of this Congress. For one thing, the lead sponsor, Congressman Dave Reichert from Washington, is retiring. So we, we very much feel the need to get this done. Um, we're working on ways and needs in energy and commerce, um, trying to get their chairs to act on the bill. And the one thing, having high co-sponsor numbers makes a difference because when you, you bring that to their attention, it tends to um, get a little action. Um, my understanding is that the Senate is waiting for the House to do it, its part. The uh, Appropriations Committee in, did include a uh, provision for lymphedema um, garments and supplies in the minibus bill that was passed in August. We also have, through Senator Cantwell's office, the CBO is working on a score and the Lymphedema Advocacy Group has provided information about costs, et cetera, uh, to move that along. So we're hoping that during, after the elections, during the lame duck <laughs> session, that we can get this to a vote. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, next slide, please. So we just thank you very much for all the help that our DLA has given us and if you, I will say this, usually we say that, you know, there, there is no pharmaceutical treatment for lymphedema, and there isn't. However, one of the things I bring up when I do my um, advocacy work is the OPEN Act, because there, I was just myself in a clinical trial at Stanford Medical Center to do exactly what the OPEN Act supports, and that's to bring a drug to market for a rare disease. So I've been able to get a little attention to, for that, 
as I've um, had my meetings. Uh, if anybody is interested, Science Magazine published an article about the clinical trial uh, last week. And if you send me an email, I'll, um, I can send you a link to the article. So thank you again, and uh, let's hope that we can move this, forward, this bill forward to passage, and um, then we can move on to other issues in the rare disease community. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Rebecca Adams um, from CQ on the midterm elections and end of year legislation. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I very much appreciate it. Just to build on what the previous speaker said, it sounded like the Lymphedema Treatment Act, Act has the great potential to pass under suspension of the rules in the House or unanimous consent in the Senate if you can just get the committee to move forward and bring it to the leadership's attention. And that, that often is the case for these kinds of bills. It's always a challenge because advocates are competing with bigger fights that is distracting for lawmakers. So I wanted to touch a bit on the outlook for Senate and House races and talk a little bit about what Congress has done this year. So polling, as you probably know, is not an exact science, and it's hard to know what will happen. But a number of observers think that we'll probably see a Democratic takeover in the House, and the Senate breakdown will probably shift only a little bit. A lot of people assume that the Senate will remain in Republican hands. Um, what we're seeing in the House is that the Democrats need a net pickup of 23 seats, and a lot of people, including some of my colleagues who watch these races more closely than I do, believe that uh, Democrats are going to get probably somewhere between 20 and 40 seats. And part of that is due <clears throat> to the fact that there's so many Republicans, particularly in the House, that are retiring this year um, is, is the highest number of lawmakers retiring since 1992. And that means there's going to be some turnover on some key committees, including Ways and Means and Energy and Commerce. So you, you mentioned um, Dave Reichardt. He's a Ways and Means member. He's a Republican from Washington who's going to be leaving. Uh, Lynn Jenkins on Ways and Means, a Republican from Kansas. Uh, Texas Republican Sam Johnson is going to be leaving, Christy Noam, Diane Black, a Republican from Tennessee, Jim Renacci. There, there are so many lawmakers that are leaving that it's going to be a very interesting opportunity next year. Um, about a fourth of the Republican members of Ways and Means are leaving, even before you consider the potential losses. And you may know that the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee Chairman, Peter Roscom of Illinois, is facing a tough fight. So we'll see what happens there, too. On the Democratic side, uh, there are fewer people leaving. Sandra Levin, the Democrat from Michigan, who's the leader on health care, is going to be leaving Ways and Means. And um, on energy and commerce, that is seeing a little bit less turnover. But there still are a lot of people leaving. About one-sixth of the Republican members are going to be leaving that committee, including the Vice Chairman Joe Barton, a Republican from Texas, Greg Harper, um, Ryan Costello, Marsha Blackburn, Kevin Kramer. These are all folks who are, who are planning to leave Congress. So on the Democratic side of energy and commerce, the health ranking, the health subcommittee ranking Democrat, Gene Green of Texas, is going to be leaving. And we're not completely sure who the next health subcommittee chairwoman or ranking Democrat will be, but it probably will be Anna Eshu of California. So in the Senate, that's where a lot of, a lot of uh, attention is going right now because there's a little more suspense about what might happen in the Senate. The biggest toss-ups right now are Nevada, Arizona, Missouri, Indiana, and Florida. In the past couple of weeks, we've seen Tennessee and Texas shift more towards the, the Republicans. It seemed for a while as if there might be some potential for Democratic movement there, but that seems less likely as we go on. It looks like North Dakota is potentially going to go to the Republicans. It looks like Heidi Heitkamp might lose. So there needs to be, in order for a shift in control in the Senate, then there needs to be a lot of focus on a number, uh, just a handful of states, um, particularly North Dakota, 
Um, but those other states that we mentioned, Nevada, Arizona, Missouri, Indiana, and Florida, are being watched very closely. So <clears throat> it's, it's good to remember that early voting has already started or will start soon in some states. So things are picking up. I don't know if anybody was able also to watch the, the Texas debate last night. That was a pretty interesting debate between Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz. And Beto O'Rourke came out a little more aggressively than we've seen him in the past. But <clears throat> he's down in the polls right now. So um, it may, we don't really know what's going to happen in the Senate, but we, we could very well end up with the same exact ratio we've got right now, which is 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats. Could be 52 Republicans and 48 Democrats. Um, could be even a couple of more, more seats in either direction. Um, it would be interesting to see if we ended up with a 50-50 Senate. I don't know if folks remember, but uh, there was a 50-50 Senate after the 2000 Senate election. And uh, at the time, the Republican leader, Trent Lott of Mississippi and Democratic leader, Tom Daschle of South Dakota, came to an agreement. They decided they would split the committee roster evenly and they'd split the staff resources in half too, but Republicans would technically get the chairmanships and they could call the, the hearings because they did have a Republican, George Bush, in the White House. So we'll see what happens. It's very interesting. Election years are always, are always very interesting. Um, we may not officially know right away what happens because there, are, there is the potential for a couple of potential runoffs. For example, Mississippi is probably going to have a runoff on November 27th, but it's likely that the Republicans would eventually win that. So in the Senate, uh, obviously Orrin Hatch's retirement is very interesting because he'll be leaving the Senate Finance Committee. It looks like um, Chuck Grassley has some interest in returning, but we don't know whether he actually will claim that spot or whether Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho might replace him. And on the Finance Committee, we also are watching to see whether D Dean Heller of Nevada and Bill Nelson of Florida win their races. And um, Hatch's retirement also affects the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. So let me just touch briefly on a few things that, that happened this year and a few things that might still happen this year. We did see overwhelming bipartisan support for the opioids law that passed and was signed by President Trump. Um, we, we may see further action on that issue later. And we saw that the Health and Human Services spending bill passed and cleared Congress before the fiscal year deadline for the first time in 22 years. It's been a long time since the labor age bill has moved that early. We did recently in the past uh, month or so see Congress clear two bills banning gag clauses on pharmacists. And we also saw a lack of action on another little provision related to drug prices. Um, Chuck Grassley and Dick Durbin of Illinois had tried to get a million dollars in statutory authority backing up HHS's ability to write rules that would require drug companies to list their prices in the ads. So they didn't get that in an appropriations bill, but we did see HHS move forward nonetheless earlier this week on, with a proposed rule on that. So that's a little bit about what Congress has been up to recently. We may see a few things move in the lame duck. There is a bill that um, would renew programs that, that pump billions of dollars into preparedness for health emergencies. So that passed the House by voice vote in September. So we're waiting on that action. We're also waiting um, to see whether the Senate will act on a House passed bill to revise how the Food and Drug Administration regulates drugs that are sold over the counter. And um, we also, of course, are waiting on some appropriations action. The FDA and the Indian Health Service both are operating on a continuation of fiscal 2018 funding. And so they're, they're really hoping to get a, a fresh bill after December 7th when government spending expires so that they can go ahead and, and move on hiring and some long-term planning. And of course, there are some interest groups that are pushing Republicans potentially in the lame duck to try another run at repealing the health care law. I don't really expect that to move forward. 
um, but Heritage, Act, Heritage Action and some others are, are making noise about trying to do that. So next year, we yeah. may see another opioids bill. It seems like about every two years, Congress passes one. We saw one in 2016, and we saw one this year. And we are likely to see continued bipartisanship on things like additional funding for the National Institutes of Health. That's been very popular, and we've seen some in increases over the years. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us. That was um, a really great recap and um, very interesting. Thank you. Um, next, um, we're going to go back to Joel White with Horizon about the opioids um, bill and law. Uh, Joel, are you there? Uh, I am. Thanks uh, for your patience as I figured out my technical challenges. <laughs> um, and Rebecca, good to hear your voice. I, uh, um, I thought you did a nice job summarizing that. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the opioid law and what we see coming next um, with a specific focus on some of the uh, technology provisions and maybe some of the public health stuff. Um, but as Rebecca indicated, this was uh, a law that passed or bill that passed with overwhelming uh, support from both parties in both the House and the Senate. It took a couple of years to come together, so it's not that, you know, this is sausage making or anything like that, but it shows how persistence can, can kind of win out um, to the points that others have made on this call about, you know, working on, on bills sometimes for years. My encouragement to you is to keep pushing because sometimes it takes that long to come together. Um, but this is kind of the second major opioid bill that um, uh, that the House, has, the House and the Senate have agreed to in the last couple of years. Um, I don't suspect it'll be the last. There's going to be another bill probably next year. Uh, or in 2020 heading into the uh, presidential election. Um, but this one was um, focusing on some discrete subset of problems specifically related to prevention, treatment, and law enforcement with a few FDA provisions kind of sprinkled in. Um, so the, the bill also provided some additional funding, particularly in the area of medication treatment. And um, uh, that is pretty important shift in terms of policy direction because uh, Republicans generally were opposed to um, spending money, taxpayer dollars, on medicines to treat problems created by medicines. And um, so it, it was a, a big shift, I think, ideologically for the Republicans to buy into the MAT therapy type um, uh, line of thinking. And I think, you know, we'll probably modernize treatments for a lot of people, particularly in the Medicaid system. Um, but in terms of the... Um, Several of the technology provisions. Back on the call here. I don't know if folks are on mute. Um, technology provisions. There were two major shifts. Hey, um, just a reminder to everyone should use their phones. We're getting some um, some static and interference, I believe, from some callers. Um, and it's only a couple hundred cases a year. Well, I'll try and just talk over it. So um, one of the, in the technology space, some of the um, uh, big changes uh, related to telehealth in both Medicaid and Medicare, telehealth services um, would be provided to folks who are sub, uh, uh, suffering from a substance use disorder or opioid um, addictions. Um, particularly important, especially for people with co-occurring conditions who are perhaps uh, challenged in terms of mobility issues or even uh, transportation issues. So uh, expansion of both the Medicaid and Medicare benefits related to telehealth. Um, secondly, expanding the use of data that are available to combat the opioid crisis. Um, really states have relied on a patchwork of databases. This is like really old technology to help identify people who are at risk. Um, and uh, the, the systems don't talk to each other. They're not on the cloud. They're not interoperable. They're not in the workflow of a prescriber or a pharmacist. So it's really hard to use these systems to identify people who could benefit from uh, treatment. And so um, the bill directs uh, states to, uh, to do a little bit better job of accessing and sharing data from these databases. 
Um, and you know, I know that that's a, a sore point for folks that they want better information out there available to prescribers, pharmacists, and patients to be able to uh, you know, get an accurate medication history based on um, uh, that information at the point of care. So something that we expect additional, um, uh, additional work on. To help facilitate some of those things, um, there's now federal requirements that are built off of what some of the states are doing. New York in particular uh, had mandated uh, that prescribers use electronic prescriptions for all controlled substances. Um, there's now a federal requirement on the Medicare side in Medicare um, Part D and in MA plans to transmit uh, controlled substance prescriptions electronically. There's also a change that would require plans in Part C and D to uh, provide electronic prior authorization services. What we're seeing now in the marketplace is physicians and pharmacists spending up to 20 hours a week answering questions from health plans about whether a patient needs a certain prescription or has met clinical criteria um, to obtain a prescription at a pharmacy. And that 20 hours a week is really eating into time that um, doctors and pharmacists can spend with, with patients. And so this would be a requirement to automate a lot of those functions and do it electronically, which should free up time for providers and pharmacists to treat all kinds of diseases, not just diseases related to um, substance use disorder. Um, and then finally, um, a requirement that um, uh, behavioral health providers uh, like psychiatrists and psychologists, community mental health providers and others who are in the behavioral or mental health space um, actually could use and receive incentives for electronic health records and other technology to help better manage patient information uh, related to their care. So there is a lot in the bill, uh, a lot more than that in the bill. Um, you know, I think in particular from, from my um, from my perspective, a lot of uh, incentives and studies around enhancing patient access to non-opioid treatment options. So how do we avoid the addiction in the first place if there are biopharmaceuticals or other um, naturopathic or homeopathic therapies available to um, help manage pain? And then um, there are also some FDA incentives um, uh, uh, related to that same topic. And then finally, I would say that there was a big recognition in here, not maybe not big, but a recognition in here that um, uh, pain is a huge issue. It's a legitimate issue. It's driving a lot of the uh, substance use disorder issues that we see. And so how do we get a better handle around how we're treating pain? And that gets into pain research and um, uh, various strategies for treating pain and, and recognizing um, the causes and ultimate um, uh, methods to alleviate it. So uh, I would expect that there's going to be a lot more on that as well um, coming in the next Congress. Um, and then the final thing I would mention is a thing called Jesse's Law that um, would require HHS to develop best practices for displaying uh, substance use disorder in electronic health records when requested by the patient. And so right now there's a federal rule that segments your um, mental health, um, or sorry, substance abuse uh, information from your uh, other medical uh, record information. And um, that's caused a lot of misdiagnosis, a lot of mistreatment opportunities, and you know, probably some medical errors and harm. And so this would direct HHS to start um, integrating those records at the patient's request. So it doesn't go as far as some advocates wanted where you'd be required to integrate the information. Um, but it starts uh, that process, and I expect that would be another area of, um, of uh, advocacy opportunities as we you know, seek to get better information to treat patients. So the bill itself was a couple, um, it was long. <laughs> it wasn't a three-page bill, double-spaced. Uh, it was um, uh, more than 1,000 pages, I believe, but um, lots of provisions in there, and happy to answer any questions on any of this stuff. Great, thank you. And if anyone does have a question, um, you can enter a question on um, the chat feature on the webinar and we can make sure to get it answered. Um, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Many of you are already familiar with um, this event, but it is scheduled to take place February 24th to 28th 
2019 here in DC, and we are busy um, planning the event and getting it organized. So, um, rare disease patients, caregivers, um, other advocates, including physicians and researchers, are welcome to join us. Um, we have a series of events lined up to empower patients, inform patients, um, educate about um, advocating on the Hill and about legislation um, taking place. It's here in Washington, D.C. It's going to be at the Reagan Center, and it's free for all advocates to attend. Um, the week's events include a documentary screening and cocktail reception on the 24th. The legislative conference um, takes place all day on the 25th, and that's where you learn um, about legislation that impacts the rare disease community and how to go on the Hill and lobby your members of Congress and their staff. Uh, Tuesday, we, we will have a lobby day breakfast. We'll have a, a keynote speaker um, to be announced. And um, that's our lobby day on Capitol Hill where all of the advocates will go on the Hill um, and meet with their members and their staff. and. Uh, we, Every Life Foundation, works to schedule all those appointments. Um, so all you have to do is come, learn, and then go on the hill. Um, and then on Wednesday, um, the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus will hold a briefing on the hill as well. And there will be the Rare Artist Reception. If you've seen our Rare Artist work before, um, this is where we showcase those artists. And then Thursday, there's a event at NIH called the Rare Disease Day, and um, people go out to NIH for this event as well. Um, the travel stipend application is open um, now. Um, Every Life Foundation offers a limited <coughs> number of travel stipends to help offset the cost of traveling to DC because it is costly. Um, one Travel stipend per family is available. The stipends are awarded, um, they're prioritized by state, so two people from each state um, by disease. We try and have a wide variety of different diseases. And um, if you're new or have never received a stipend before, um, that's also taken into account. The, uh, the stipends are $400 for those living in Maryland and Virginia, uh, $800 for the rest of the United States, continental United States, and then $1,000 for those coming from Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. So you can apply for a travel stipend until December 14th. You can go to rareadvocates.org backslash RDW to find the application. And then people will hear by December 21st whether they receive a travel stipend or have been placed on a waiting list. And um, we'll give more information the closer that we get to Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill, and we'll discuss it most likely at our next meeting. Our next RDLA meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 14th at noon Eastern Standard Time. And if you'd like to speak or if you have any topic suggestions or ideas, please feel free to contact me. My email address is listed there, sbonfelden at everylifefoundation.org. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and putting up with our technical difficulties. This was my first <coughs> webinar. And um, I really appreciate everyone joining us, and I look forward to continuing to uh, work with you all. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right, have a great day.